Hello, everybody. This is Mr. Hinnon, and this is um, kind of the breakdown of, of all the applications of uniform circular motion. So we're going to look at our first application here, which is friction on a unbanked or a flat curve. And so when I talk about that, I'm talking about some kind of object trying to travel around a curve and how that goes. I'm going to actually start this off by doing something a little bit different. So um, I actually have a link here. I'm going to see if I can actually go to this link and if it'll take me there. And if it won't, then we'll do this. We're going to end it. And um, we're going to do that. And I'm going to jump to a particular website here. And it's called the Physics Avery. Um, it's kind of a neat one. I've not used it a whole lot. But in the Physics Avery, let's see if I can find it. Do, 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 there it is. They have a whole bunch of like physics applications, and one of them that I found recently is this one that's called um, circular friction. So take a look at it, and basically what it is is it's kind of designed as a lab to actually go through a curve, um, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently. We're just going to look at... Uh, this object, a car, for example, kind of driving around a curve. So, and then you have the ability to kind of change some things. You can change things like the mass, the speed, the radius, that type of stuff. So I'm gonna start out by just kind of at 100 kilograms, going a speed of 20 meters per second and a radius of 100 meters. So that's the radius of this curve right here. Um, can this car make it? So if I hit start, what you can do is you can watch the car and sure enough, it follows that yellow line and it makes it through. We're all good. Then you can stop and then you can try some new things. Let's say that I'm going to make the car go faster. So let's have it go 30 meters per second around the same radius and the same. So if I increase the speed, what's gonna happen? What I notice is all of a sudden the car can't make this curve and it goes sliding off. And so something is not allowing this to actually be held on here. And that's one of the things we're going to kind of look at. Um, let's put this back at 20. What happens if I increase that mass? Let's make it 2,000 kilograms instead and hit that start. Hey, look at that. The car still makes it. So it sounds like maybe the mass doesn't seem to affect it as much. Interesting. Let's try changing the radius. Let's make, so we can make it at 20. What if I make it a 50 meter radius? So I make it a tighter turn, but we're still gonna try to do it at 20 meters per second. I hit start. No, nope, looks like you can't make it. It doesn't even make it to the end of this curve. So that's kind of crazy. So it looks like radius is gonna affect whether you can negotiate it and speed is gonna affect, but maybe not mass. So I wanna take a look at those specifically in our notes. So let's pull this up. Let's start from the beginning. Our different applications here and see what we can kind of come up with. So I'm going to get my pen so I can write some stuff and let's start. Let's start with a little question. So the maximum speed at which a car can safely negotiate, and when we say negotiate it means it can actually drive around that curve, um, depends on all the following except which. Okay, so one of the things we just saw is when I changed the radius of the curve, that definitely affected. So it has to be definitely the diameter of this curve. So I'm going to cross that one off. That definitely has to affect it. The next thing is when you think about going around a curve or going around something that's not banked, um, there has to be some force that holds you in. And I would assume, based on the title of that particular lab, that it has to be friction that's holding you in. But I've got two possibilities. I've got static and kinetic friction here. And which one do you think is going to kind of affect it? The other question part, the other part is the acceleration of gravity. And we know that gravity is acting on it. And it's kind of a weird when you're like, does that seem to affect it at all? And I would say that it does affect it because it's not so much the mass that we're worried about, but we are worried about gravity holding you onto the surface. So we are going to have that, but it's 
a matter of is it static or kinetic friction so kinetic is actually sliding friction when you're actually sliding i don't want this car to actually slide if it safely negotiates or makes it around the curve so it can't be kinetic friction um, it has to be static friction that it's actually being dependent on. We do not want it to slide if it's going to negotiate. We saw those situations where the car didn't make it, it slid off the curve. So this is the third one. So I would say it depends on all the following except kinetic friction. So ding, 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 A would be the correct answer. So that sounds weird because we think about the fact that we're going around a curve and you're like, there has to be some force that holds you in the center. But what it is, is it's static friction. When I'm going around this curve, if this car is going to try to negotiate this curve, it's going to try to go around. Well, it's part of this big circle. So when we talk about a curve having a radius, that's where it's coming from. So we have the radius here. And there has to be some force that's applying to the center, and it's static friction on these tires here that's actually going to provide that force toward the center. And that's what they're trying to represent here. So it's static friction force that's going to actually equal your centripetal force. Let's put centripetal force here. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to play around. I'm going to create a little equation. I love to do stuff like this. So we know from chapter four the static friction force should be equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And then that would equal my centripetal force equation, which is going to be the mass of the object times speed squared divided by the radius of the curve. Now, other parts that I can actually look at with my nice little picture here is there's got to be some other forces acting on it. So, for example, we know there's going to be a force of gravity that's going to try to pull this car downward. So there's the force of gravity. This is our normal mass times gravity. That's our, that's our weight of our object. So that's one of the forces that's going to act on it. Well, what other force would act on it? We know that the road itself has to hold it up. So there should be some kind of normal force acting upward on this thing. In this particular case, if we're on a flat curve, there is no tilt to it. It's not an incline. It's flat. And if there's nothing else that's pushing down on it or lifting up on it, in other words, if we're ignoring any lift features. So as a car actually drives, there is a little bit of lift because of airflow over it. Uh, when you get into fluids um, and fluid mechanics, you'll talk about a little bit of lift, kind of like with an airplane wing. But if there's no lift caused by that airflow, then those two should just equal each other. So this normal force should just equal the force of gravity, or in other words, should equal the mass times gravity. So it should equal this a little bit. I'm going to bring in the coefficient of static friction here then. So now I've got mu mg. I've had that before. I've talked about the gum equation when we are talking about friction on a flat surface and things like that. That's going to equal the mass times speed squared over radius. We saw when we changed that car in the physics Avery to that lab, if I increase the mass from 1,000 to 2,000, it didn't affect it. It still made that curve. And the reason why, if you notice, as long as you're not talking about tilting over or flipping, um, which we'll talk about with rotational motion, obviously a semi has to worry about flipping over or an SUV might flip over. But if you assume it's not going to flip or twist, then the mass of the object actually does not matter. That's why on a curve, when you're driving down the interstate, and it'll say, okay, this curve, you can only go 50 miles per hour or 45 miles per hour, but it's not actually tilted at all. It's not banked. That's because it doesn't matter what kind of car you have. You, As long as you don't tip over, you should still be able to make that curve. I'm going to rearrange this. I always like to solve it for V. And so my ultimate equation here, when I solve it for V, is going to be, I'm going to bring this R over to the other side. I end up with, um, oh, I'm going to actually put it right here that V, and it's V squared originally, so I'm going to put a little square root over here. It's going to equal the square root of R, the radius of the curve, times mu S, so that's going to be the coefficient of static friction, times gravity. So I sometimes call this my rug equation because 
imagine like you're trying to run around a curve on a rug, then that's not going to work. We don't have enough friction there. But this is a great way of actually calculating the speed based off of three things. You need the radius, coefficient of static friction, acceleration of gravity. So going back to our previous question, that's why those things were in there. The diameter is related to the radius, acceleration of gravity, coefficient of static friction. Perfect. Last but not least, let's just try one more little problem and then I'll be done. So let's say a rancher has a hay bale in the back of their SUV. They drive around an unbaked curve and they want that hay bale not to slide around. And what we want to know is what is the coefficient of static friction, the minimum, so that they go around a radius of 48 meters at a speed of 16 meters per second. Notice I put A on here that it can't be determined without knowing the mass of the hay bale. That is irrelevant. We don't care what the mass of the hay bale is. We should be able to find this. So I'm going to start with my rug equation. The square root of R mu times G. But now I'm going to try to solve for that mu. So I'm going to square it, divide by R, divide by G. So the coefficient of static friction should be V squared over RG. So I can plug all my numbers in. So I've got 16 squared over, I take 48 times 9.8. And we just have to calculate that out. Should give us our nice little coefficient of friction here. So I'm going to stop this. I'm going to end the show for just a second. I'm going to keep these different things on here. Let's pull out a hand dandy calculator. Pull this over to the side. Let's see what we got. So we're going to take 16. We're going to square it. We're going to divide that by the quantity 48 times 9.8 in quantity. Hit equals. I get 0.544, blah, blah, blah. Coming back here, it looks like E would be our best answer. We'd actually be able to find that coefficient about 0.54 for the coefficient. Remember, coefficient doesn't actually have a unit. It's just a number. So that pretty much finishes our notes on um, friction and application um, dealing with this. Check out the couple of Google um, form questions, and we'll see what we can get figured out from there. Hope you enjoyed.